Islam can be a little confusing. You meet a Muslim at the grocery store, nicest person in the world, cute kids, loves America. Later that day, you turn on your television and wait a minute, some other Muslim just blew up the grocery store. What's going on here? Who represents Islam? The peaceful Muslim buying tomatoes or the violent Muslim bombing tomatoes? You'd like an answer, so you open up the Quran. You read Surah 2, 256, there is no compulsion in religion. That sounds peaceful and tolerant. I guess the peaceful Muslims are the true followers of Islam. Then you go to Surah 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah. That's not nice. Now it seems like the violent Muslims got it right. The evidence points in different directions, so what are you supposed to believe? Partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't. If you've ever wondered why there are both peaceful and violent passages in the Quran, if it's ever bothered you that Muslims demand religious tolerance in the West while Christians and Jews can't build churches or synagogues in Saudi Arabia, if you've never quite grasped why organizations like CARE or ISNA claim that Islam is a religion of peace while they support terrorism behind the scenes, welcome to the most important video you'll ever watch. You can't understand Islam in the world today without understanding one essential fact. Jihad proceeds in stages. As the tiny tadpole grows into the bellowing bullfrog, as the lowly acorn becomes the mighty oak, as adorable parent trap Lindsay Lohan transforms into whatever she is now, so also the tolerant toddler of peaceful Islam eventually goes through puberty. That's when we all find out what full-grown, Jew-hatin', church-burnin', wife-beatin', apostate-killin', Allahu Akbar yellin' Islam is really like in all its blood-spattered glory. Whether you look at the life of Muhammad, or the early Muslim community, or the Quran, or the Hadith, or the Sira literature, or classical Muslim commentaries, or modern Muslim scholarship, or the spread of Islam in the world today, you'll find the exact same pattern. There are three stages in the call to jihad, depending on the status of Muslims in a society. And if you understand these three stages, you'll understand Islam, 14 centuries of Islamic history, and the situation we're in right now. Partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't. Stage one, stealth jihad. When Muslims are completely outnumbered and can't possibly win a physical confrontation with unbelievers, they're commanded to promote peace with non-Muslims and to preach a message of tolerance. For instance, when Muhammad and his followers were a persecuted minority in Mecca, they criticized the beliefs of the polytheists, but they did so peacefully. The revelations Muhammad received during this time proclaimed a future judgment for unbelievers. Allah will one day punish those who reject Muhammad. But in the meantime, to each his own. Live and let live. Coexist. A characteristic chapter from this period is Surah 109. As the Holy Quran tells us, Say, O unbelievers, I do not serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him whom I serve, nor am I going to serve that which you serve, nor are you going to serve him whom I serve. You shall have your religion, and I shall have my religion. Muslims in the West point to passages like this as evidence that Islam is inherently peaceful. But we know from Muslim sources that while Muhammad was calling for religious tolerance in Mecca, he was already planning to conquer the world in the name of Allah. He even tried to lure pagans to Islam by promising them victory over the non-Arabs. Let's look at a passage. One day, some of Muhammad's tribesmen went to his uncle, Abu Talib, because they wanted to arrange a truce with Muhammad. They wanted Muhammad to stop criticizing their beliefs. Watch what happens. Abu Talib sent for the Messenger of Allah, and when he came in, he said, Nephew, here are the sheikhs and nobles of your tribe. They have asked for justice against you, that you should desist from reviling their gods, and they will leave you to your god. Uncle, he said, shall I not summon them to something which is better for them than their gods? What do you summon them to? he asked. He replied, I summon them to utter a saying through which the Arabs will submit to them, and they will rule over the non-Arabs. Abu Jahl said from among the gathering, What is it by your father? We will give you it and ten like it. He answered, that you should say, there is no deity but Allah. Think about this for a moment. Muhammad's walking around Mecca calling for peace and tolerance. 
But behind closed doors, he tells the Quraysh, join me and we'll rule over the non-Arabs, Christians, Jews, Persians, etc. These groups aren't attacking Muhammad at all, and he's already planning to conquer them. What does he need in order to subjugate the non-Muslims? He needs an army. And so he asks his tribe to convert to Islam. Now, how many times have we seen Muslim groups in the world today calling for tolerance in public, but saying something very different in private? It goes back to Muhammad. One of the key features of stage one is taqiyya, concealing Islam's true intentions in order to protect the Muslim community. This was eventually made explicit in Surah 328. As the Holy Quran tells us, Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah, unless it be that ye but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. Muslims aren't allowed to be friends with non-Muslims unless they're outnumbered and they feel like they're in danger from a stronger adversary. That's when Muslims are told to pretend to be friendly. One of Islam's greatest scholars, Ibn Kathir, comments, in this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship outwardly, but never inwardly. Abu Darda, one of Muhammad's companions, put it this way, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. as alaikum. Another key feature of stage one is victim status. Muslims like to pretend that Muhammad and his followers were persecuted in Mecca simply because they were Muslims. Total nonsense. They were persecuted for antagonizing the Meccans by mocking their beliefs. We read in At-Tabari, The Messenger of Allah proclaimed Allah's message openly and declared Islam publicly to his fellow tribesmen. When he did so, they did not withdraw from him or reject him in any way until he spoke of their gods and denounced them. When he did this, they took exception to it and united in opposition and hostility to him except for those of them whom Allah had protected from error by means of Islam. Notice that the pagans of Mecca had no problem with Muhammad preaching Islam. They became angry when he began attacking their beliefs, and they had to put up with quite a bit. Listen to this description of what the pagans went through in their own words. We have never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. as alaikum. Muhammad was condemning their beliefs and their values. He was causing division in the city. Not too extreme from a Western perspective. What's interesting is that when the people of Mecca responded in kind, and mocked Islam, Muslims said, oh, they're persecuting us. What evil people attacking us because of our beliefs. Double standards. One of the goals of the stealth jihad stage is to give Islam a privileged status above other religions. But Muhammad's constant antagonism towards the Meccans did lead to actual persecution. And this persecution of the early Muslim community was the best thing that ever happened to Islam. When people heard that poor, defenseless Muslims were being mistreated, they rushed to Muhammad's aid. The Christians of Abyssinia, the Jews of Medina, and various pagan groups all agreed, at one time or another, to protect Muslims from the mean, bigoted Islamophobes in Mecca. Now keep in mind, Muhammad was already planning to conquer all of these people. But they didn't know that. All they knew was that Muslims were being persecuted, and they wanted to help. Once Muhammad and his followers had formed enough alliances and were no longer at the mercy of the Meccans, the message of the Quran suddenly changed. Partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't. Stage two, defensive jihad. When there are enough Muslims and resources to defend the Islamic community from attacks, persecution or criticism, Muslims are called to engage in defensive jihad, fighting unbelievers who pose a physical or intellectual threat to Islam. After the city of Yathrib, now called Medina, agreed to protect the Muslim community, Muhammad and his followers left Mecca, and they were given permission to fight. Surah 22, 39-40. As the Holy Quran tells us, 
Permission to fight is given to those upon whom war is made because they are oppressed, and most surely Allah is well able to assist them, those who have been expelled from their homes without a just cause, except that they say, Our Lord is Allah. Did you catch that? According to the Quran, Muslims were kicked out of Mecca simply because they believed in Allah. We've already seen that the Meccans had no problem with Muslims believing in Allah or even with Muslims preaching Islam. They had a problem with Muhammad mocking their religion and causing division in their city. But again, Muslims needed victim status for their protection, so I guess Allah decided to fudge history just a little. And throughout history, Islam has demonstrated through words and deeds the possibilities of religious tolerance and racial equality. Now that Muhammad had several non-Muslim groups ready to defend him, he turned to the primary tactic of stage two, terrorism. The people of Mecca depended on the caravan trade for their survival. Anyone who had money would invest it, hoping to get back something extra to feed their families. If a caravan was robbed or didn't return, children might starve. So instead of living a peaceful life in Medina, Muhammad started attacking the Meccan caravans. Muslims launched seven attacks against the caravans, and the Meccans never retaliated. During the seventh attack, Muslims killed a man, and they took the goods and some captives as well. The problem was that it was still the holy month when everyone agreed not to fight. Muhammad was a bit worried about this at first, but then he received Surah 2, 217. As the Holy Quran tells us, They question thee, O Muhammad, with regard to warfare in the sacred month. Say, warfare therein is a great transgression, but to turn men from the way of Allah, and to disbelieve in him and in the inviolable place of worship, and to expel his people thence is a greater transgression with Allah, for persecution is worse than killing. Persecution is worse than killing. Yes, we killed a man during the holy month when there was a universal agreement not to fight, but you persecuted us, and that's worse. So don't you dare judge us. The Meccans had been trying to avoid war, but it was clear that the Muslims weren't going to stop attacking the caravans, and that Meccan trade and the livelihood of the city would never be safe. So the pagan tribes sent an army to protect the next caravan. Muslims attacked and defeated the Meccans at what became known as the Battle of Badr. Notice that the first real battle between Muslims and non-Muslims was a result of non-Muslims trying to protect themselves from Muslims terrorizing their trade routes. Islam has a proud tradition of tolerance. It didn't take long for Muhammad's protectors to realize that they had been duped. Muslims weren't quite the innocent victims they had claimed to be. Muhammad and his followers were far more greedy and violent than the pagans they were now attacking. But these disillusioned defenders soon learn that once you agree to support Muhammad, you don't get to change your mind. Anything other than perfect allegiance to Muhammad becomes grounds for expulsion, seizing property, enslavement, or annihilation. Three Jewish tribes in Medina found that out the hard way. A proud tradition of tolerance. Non-Muslims also learned that no matter how much they disagreed with Muhammad's campaign of violence and intimidation, they had to keep their mouths shut. Muhammad began ordering the assassination of critics during stage two. People who spoke out against Islam or wrote poems about Muhammad were brutally murdered. And the citizens of Medina, the very people who had invited Muslims into their city, saw their rights rapidly disappearing in the name of Allah. Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Stage two then is characterized by defensive fighting, fighting those who attack the Muslim community in some way. What we need to get our minds around, however, is that Muslims have a much broader definition of what constitutes an attack than anything we're familiar with. Persecution and military aggression certainly count as attacks, but as we've seen, criticizing Islam counts as an attack. Backing out of alliances after you figure out Muhammad's true intentions counts as an attack. And in the defensive jihad stage, Muslims are ordered to respond to these attacks with physical violence and terrorism. Partnership between America and Islam must be based on what Islam is, not what it isn't. Stage three, offensive jihad. When Muslims establish a majority and achieve political power in an area, they are commanded to begin offensive jihad. 
Once Mecca and Arabia were under Muhammad's control, the message of the Quran changed yet again. Suddenly, Muslims weren't just told to fight against aggressors. They were commanded to fight non-Muslims simply for being non-Muslims. As the Holy Quran tells us, O oh, Prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. If Muslims have the military strength to expand their political power and to violently subjugate non-Muslim populations, forcing these non-Muslims to pay tribute, the Quran commands them to do so. Surah 929. As the Holy Quran tells us, Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This verse doesn't order Muslims to fight oppressors or even critics. It orders Muslims to fight those who don't believe in Allah. Tolerance. 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 We find similar teachings in Islam's most trusted collections of ahadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, 6924. Muhammad said, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, La Allaha illallah. None has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and whoever said, La Allaha illallah, Allah will save his property and his life from me. Tolerance. Religious tolerance. Tolerance. Religious tolerance. Sahih Muslim, number 30. Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah. Muhammad didn't say, I've been commanded to fight people until they stop persecuting us. That would be stage two. It's stage three. And the same guy who complained just a few years earlier that people were persecuting him because of his beliefs now says he's been commanded to fight people based on what they believe. Total hypocrisy. Religious tolerance. Religious tolerance. Religious tolerance. In the offensive jihad stage, Muslims can also expel Christians and Jews from lands they've been living in for centuries in order to keep certain areas that are important to the Muslim community pure. Areas such as Arabia. In Sahih Muslim 4366, Muhammad says, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. He won't leave anyone but Muslims. Is this a man who promoted religious diversity and tolerance? Only when he was in the minority. As soon as Muslims had control of the government, diversity and tolerance went out the window along with the Jews and Christians. We will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. So this is the pattern that's been laid down for Muslims by their prophet. Stage one, stealth jihad. When Muslims are too weak to fight, they promote peace and tolerance outwardly, but never inwardly. They practice taqiyya, they prepare for jihad behind the scenes, they claim victim status, and they seek special privileges for Islam. Stage two, defensive jihad. When Muslims are strong enough to fight, but not strong enough to subjugate the unbelievers, they terrorize their enemies, murder critics, and look for excuses to attack other groups. Stage three, offensive jihad. When Muslims are in the majority, they violently subjugate all non-Muslims, they strive to expand their political dominion, and they rid important Muslim lands of all non-Muslims. This is the pattern we find in the Quran, in the Hadith, and in the Muslim commentaries. Assalamu alaikum. Now, look around the world and tell me what you see. Saudi Arabia, what stage are they in? Stage three, obviously. Massive Muslim majority. Lo and behold, if you're not a Muslim, you can't preach, you can't build a place of worship, you can't even set foot in the city of Mecca. Exactly what we would expect based on the Muslim sources. Certain places in Africa, and I'd say some areas of Europe, are in stage two. Muslims have enough fighters and resources and alliances to fight defensively. 
And what do we see? We see terrorism. We see churches being burned to the ground or blown up in Nigeria and Ethiopia. We see no-go zones forming and critics of Islam being killed, even in Europe. Again, exactly what we would expect based on the Muslim sources. Here in America, where Muslims form a small minority of the population, what stage are we in? Stage one. What's Islam all about, according to American Muslims? It's all about peace and tolerance. Muslims just want to be like everyone else, but racist hate mongers are attacking them because of their beliefs. That's why we should all be thankful that the government and Christians and Jews are stepping in to defend Muslims from bigots and Islamophobes, just as governments and Christians and Jews stepped in to defend Muslims during the time of Muhammad. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. My friends, how difficult is this to figure out? What have we discussed that a six-year-old couldn't understand? Muslims have been using the same playbook for 14 centuries. It's in all their sources. It's as plain as day. And yet, our leaders and the media just can't understand why Christians and Jews are second-class citizens in the Muslim world, or why Muslims in Europe are ready to kill over cartoons, or why Muslims in America are so desperate for victim status they'll cry discrimination when a home improvement store doesn't pay for advertising on one of the most boring shows ever. It's all right here. Someone can't understand this. I'd say he doesn't want to understand it. But we've reached a point in history when we can no longer afford to be willfully stupid. If our leaders are incapable of grasping the three-step strategy of jihadists, they have no business leading a marching band, let alone a Western nation. Unfortunately, Muslims have been so successful in their stage one operations, they've convinced our leaders and the media that the only information we need when it comes to Islam is what's handed to us by terrorist-linked Muslim organizations like CARE. Bin Laden was not a Muslim leader. We're officially on our own. If we want to popularize this information, we'll have to do it ourselves. Sending this video to everyone you know would be a good start. I also think someone needs to put this material into a pamphlet so we can all pass out copies. Oh, what's this? It's a double-sided pamphlet discussing the three stages of jihad. Seems I've already done most of the work for you. All you need to do is go to my blog, AnsweringMuslims.com, click on the Jihad tab at the top, and open the Three Stages of Jihad PDF pamphlet file. You can print this out, fold it up, and give it to those who need to know about jihad, which is pretty much everyone. Islam's greatest ally in the West is ignorance. Jihadists can't subjugate us through physical force, so they're doing their best to subjugate our minds. The ultimate obstacle to global jihad, then, is an informed population of free people. Wouldn't you like to be an obstacle to jihad and Sharia? I know I would. In 2012, let's make a special, freedom-sized effort to educate ourselves and others about the inner workings of the jihadist machine. And let us call our project Operation Monkey Wrench. I think it's important to add a quick appendix on westernized Muslims. I've said in this video that Muslims in stage one are commanded to deceive non-Muslims in order to keep us ignorant of Islam's violent goals. But if you present this information to your Muslim friends, they're going to deny it. Now, does this mean they're practicing taqiyya? No. When your Muslim friends tell you that Islam is a religion of peace, are they trying to trick you? Probably not. Most Muslims in America have been influenced by Western values more than they've been influenced by Islam. They may pray five times a day or fast during Ramadan, but their knowledge of Islam doesn't get much deeper than that. They've read very little of what's in their sources, and they know practically nothing about what we've discussed in this video. So, chances are, when your Muslim friends tell you that Islam is peaceful, they really believe it. No need to accuse them of lying. Sadly, your westernized Muslim friends aren't a source of Islamic doctrine. Islamic doctrine is grounded in the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad, and these sources are perfectly clear when it comes to jihad. So, I think we need to add another stage to our three stages. Stage zero, the totally clueless about jihad 
stage.